Hello everybody, welcome to Wine World TV, the best wine show anywhere. I'm your host, Mark Fusco. Before we get started, make sure you're smashing that like button and subscribing to the channel. Every like and subscription helps build the channel even better. Spread the word to your friends about the best wine show anywhere. All right, so I'm about to embark on a series of reviews of wines from Domaine Bousquet. I've reviewed several of their wines over the past few years. I'll try to give you the highlights of their background in this episode to get you caught up if this is the, your first time seeing any of my reviews of their wines. So Jean Bousquet had a winery in the Carcassonne area of southwest France. In 1990, he took a vacation to Argentina and visited the Guatiari Valley. This is in the Tupangato region of the larger Uco Valley in the western central part of Argentina. The city of Mendoza is a little more than an hour's drive to the north. John was so enamored with the area, he decided to sell everything in France and invest in a winery in the area in 19, 1997. He initially purchased 988 acres of, of land, and then over the next few years, he dug a 400, not nine, a 495 foot well to access water. This is effectively a desert. Uh, in, it's also in the massive rain shadow of the Andes Mountains, which serve as a dramatic backdrop to the property. Irrigation is vital in this part of the country, and without it, you really can't grow anything at scale. So then he sold off parcels of the land to help fund the building of the winery, and eventually only retaining 173 acres when his first vintage was released in 2005. Now since then, the estate, the estate has grown to 667 acres. Now here's what I'm not sure about. And we had a Zoom call and I asked this question, but they didn't really give me an answer I think that I don't think they understood my question. I don't know how much of this 667 acres they own now is from the original land purchase or it's other land in the area. I kind of think that they kind of bought the land back, but I don't know. Anyway, this is high altitude viticulture. The property is around 3,700 feet. The valley itself can go as high as 5,249 feet. This is me like using Google Earth to kind of figure all this out. And the winery is actually less than 10 miles from the Andes foothills. The theory for picking this area was to combine a cooler climate with an area that has massive amounts of sunshine. While you need to have a minimum average temperature for viticulture to happen, you also need sunlight hours, and that's in abundance here. This yields a long growing season, plenty of time to get not just sugar ripeness, but also what we call phenolic ripeness. Think of a teenager that gets that growth spurt and is like lanky. But in this case, the teenager's growth is slow but steady. The altitude provides a few things. First, you have a temperate climate. It doesn't get too hot. While heat is important, once you get into the 90s in Fahrenheit, photosynthesis shuts down. So those you know, 100 degree days we get in Texas doesn't really exactly benefit the grapes. With a high altitude, you can also have cool nights. In this area, the temperature swing or diurnal shift or swing can be as much as 60 degrees Fahrenheit. This is the key to retaining acidity in grapes and allows them to rest at night. As I mentioned, there is abundant sunlight here, anywhere from 330 to 360 sunny days. That's a lot. Being this high up, there are more UV rays. Just like humans, grapes react to UV by creating more grape skin tannin, just like melanin in human skin. This is most noticeable in red wines, giving them higher extraction of color. Now, the domain soils are mostly sand. This is a benefit for a few reasons. One, low fertility. Grapes will soak up everything you give them, and very fertile soil usually means lower quality grapes. They also have great drainage with sand. Uh, for the most part, grapes do well in soil that doesn't retain significant amounts of water. Some do, but ideally you want a well-drained soil over like something like clay, which retains soil. You want it close enough to be accessible to the vine's roots, but far enough so that those roots aren't like submerged in water. And then phylloxera hates sand. 
So you can have own rooted vines in there. All right, so being so close to the Andes also brings wind. In Argentina, it's known as the Zonda. There are actually three winds in Argentina, the Polar, Zonda, and Sudestada. The Zonda is the one that most of us wine students are familiar with since it's the most influential during the growing season. This is during October to April in the Southern Hemisphere. The Polar or Pompero wind comes from the Southwest and is dry like the Zonda. Normally blows during the winter though. Then the Zonda takes over directly from the West from the Andes. This is a cold and dry wind. At the end of the summer, so right around harvest time, the Sudestada takes over from the Southeast. This is a cooler wind that carries moisture from the Atlantic. Now with the Zonda being the primary wind during growing season, it helps moderate the temperature. This is a desert. It would be a hot desert if it wasn't for the wind. Also, because it's a dry wind, you have less disease pressure from humidity. The larger Uco Valley gets about 18 inches of rainfall a year. That's under the 20 inches necessary, typically, for viticulture. So those 500 foot wells are crucial. This also plays, what, this also plays into reducing disease pressure. Now, all these things combine to allow Dome Bousquet to be 100% organic in their viticulture. That doesn't mean a winery has to have these conditions to produce organic grapes, but you know what? It helps. Conventional farming with synthetic fertilizers and pesticides aren't necessary. You can really rely on organic versions. You can rely on organic versions if needed. So I have my Freestyle Friday series of videos all about farming practices and the wines that come from them going on too. You should have started seeing them by now. This is the first of all the, the wines I'm doing, but I also had the, the series of wine, the series of episodes about why wine costs what it does, and then the, uh, the the comparison of things. So I'm not sure if they've already started by the time you see this or not, but if they haven't, you should see them really soon. So check them out. The 2021 Domaine Bousquet Sauvignon Blanc suggested retail price is $13. Yes, 2021. Harvest was pretty early, even for the Southern Hemisphere during the first two weeks of February. It's from the Guatiari Valley, which is in Tupangato, which is in Uco Valley, which is Mendoza, Argentina. 100% Sauvignon Blanc. Certified organic vineyard. It's made with organic grapes. This is different than 100% organic, but it does require 100% organic grapes. So please see my episodes on organic farming and the wines. Remember, if they aren't on my channel or website yet, they will be soon. These grapes are hand harvested. Elevation is 1,200 meters or 3,900 feet. The soil is gravel and sand. The alcohol is 12.2%. So harvested early, low bricks, low alcohol. TA or total acidity is 7.35 grams per liter. The pH is 3.26 and the residual sugar is a 0 0.9 grams per liter. This is going to be bone dry or dry AF. All right, let's get into the wine. I am super excited to do this. If you hear any stuff in the background, my father just came home from being out. So he's making a little bit of noise in the background. Just saying. He probably didn't hear me say that though. Benefit to having the green screen, well actually the blue screen. And the fact that um, because it's, I got both of them up, you really can't see, you can't see through them. It's pretty opaque. I have no idea if he turned the lights on in the background. He might have. I don't know. But it doesn't block the sound. So when I do a lot of these stuff really late at night, like 2 in the morning, or midnight, 1 in the morning, the, the dishwasher sometimes is on. I use magic to not have the sound, but occasionally it does come through in the, on the episodes. Anyway. All right, so... As far as you're concerned, this is the first wine of the whole series, but this is wine number one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. This is wine number nine tonight. I still have two more to do. So, uh, you're going to hear us a lot of the white wines throughout this series of 20 plus wines. You know, medium minus concentration of color, kind of light, light straw actually. But it's, it's yellow. It's actually, there's actually a little bit of, um, 
I want to say brass. It's like a darker yellow. Anyway, let's check it out. We'll call it medium plus on the Aromatics. It's not super jumping out, but it's, I don't have to like stick my nose all the way into it to like smell anything. You know what's great about this is, so, so far, even though this is wine number one for what you're all seeing, and you all, not y'all, I don't say that word. It's the first non-Chardonnay or Albarino based wine I've had the entire night. Oh no, I had Chardonnay, yeah, Chardonnay and Albarino based wine. <laughs> it's actually the only Sauvignon Blanc in the entire flight of white wines. I'm super excited to have some of this right now. All right, as I just took a big whiff of that. So now we get like that tropical fruit, that guava, papaya, a little bit of gooseberry. It's actually a little, I don't want to call it smokiness, but there's a little bit of like something else going on here. Maybe herbaceousness. It's probably the pyrazines. The pyrazines are not over the top. I was expecting like huge amounts of like bell pepper or jalapeno. Uh, it's, it's, it's there. It's there, but it's really subdued. That's what the, I think it was. I was getting that herbaceousness, kind of greenness out of it. Maybe that smokiness, maybe like a roasted pepper. But yeah, um, it's actually a, a really nice, refreshing thing to smell after smelling like nine Chardonnays and Albarino, especially considering the majority of the wines are Albarino based tonight. For me, Spices and Vina Verde, you're going to be seeing eventually, but I have like a ton of Bousquet wines to do. So yeah. Let's get acid on this. Yeah. You know, it's great. 12.2% alcohol. So it's, it's, this is like kind of a porch pounder too, man. Yeah. Anyway, um, acidity's really high. It's bone dry. I'm digging this wine. How much is this again? $13? Good Lord. That's... So, on the flavor profile, you got that really crisp fruit. I wouldn't call it, like, super underripe, but it's in that slightly underripe tart nature. You've got that guava, that papaya, gooseberry. You also get a little bit of peach on this. Uh, not quite pineapple, but it's kind of there. But considering this early harvest, low alcohol, there isn't a lot of pyrazine. So I'm going to attribute that to the huge diurnal shift that the acid is really retained, but you're getting phenolic ripeness out of this that the pyrazines are actually being ripened out, but you're not hitting high bricks. Because if you're hitting 12.2% and 0.9 RS, you're, 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 you're harvesting it like, I think, and I'll put a lower third, but you should be harvesting maybe around 22 bricks, 21 bricks, 20 bricks? I don't know. Uh, what I don't know is, so let's say you harvest at 24 bricks, you fully ferment to dry, well, what does that exactly mean? It doesn't mean zero RS, residual sugar, but there's a reasonable amount of sugar that'll be left over from any fermentation. So it, it, there's no like, I, I don't think there's actually a chart that can tell you all this, but you'll get like, you have a certain bricks level at harvest and it'll give you a certain expectation of alcohol level for fully fermented. I like this one a lot, especially for thirteen dollars. Now, with that said, probably one of the reasons why I like it is because it's not Chardonnay and it's not Albarino, which I like Albarino, but so it's refreshing. It's kind of new, a little bit kind of cool. It tastes really good, but there isn't a lot going on. Like it's really. I say that and I talked about guava and mango and not really mango, papaya, a little bit of pineapple, herbaceousness. I mean, it's, there actually is a decent amount going on, but it feels really linear. Not one dimensional, but linear. And it's really the acid is linear on this. It tastes good. I'm excited about this. You know, it, 
And this, this wine is not cold, 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 but it's not super room temperature, but it is warm enough that I should be able to really get everything out of it. The pyrazine is just really subdued. And like I said, I'm going to, I'm going to attribute that to, to um, phenolic ripeness, not necessarily anything else, because usually Sauvignon Blanc, that bell pepper or jalapeno is really prominent, and it's not that prominent here, which is, I'm cool with that. It tastes really good. I already said that about a billion times. You should get it. You should get it. Anyway, that's going to do it for today's show. Again, if you're enjoying what I'm doing here, make sure you hit the like button and subscribe, and then tell your friends. Until next time, bring some killer Argentine Sauvignon Blanc.